is Liz Harvey Roberts. I'm Chief Development Officer here for the California Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And I'm so glad that you could join us for our next webinar in our series, The Determining Decade. So I would like to introduce at this point, point Mark Zimmering, who is our Indo-Pacific Tuna Program Director. Okay, thanks, Liz. And I guess now the pressure is on for me to be a dynamic presenter today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Happy Earth Day, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, as Liz said, these are really strange and, and difficult times. And I think for those of us lucky enough to find ourselves healthy and, and safe, um, today's realities have really strengthened our sense of urgency and, and resolve. And, you know, I think in the spirit of Earth Day's original teachings 50 years ago, I'm really honored to be with you all today to, to share with you all some of the exciting work uh, we're doing to end what, what former NOAA Administrator Jane Luchenko, Jane Luchenko calls the wild, wild, wet era of, of global fisheries. Uh, before I dig in, let me share a little bit about myself. I grew up on the North Shore of Massachusetts uh, eating Ipswich steamers that were farmed and collected by, by friends and dreaming about being a dolphin trainer. And naturally, this led me to uh, almost a decade on Wall Street, um, doing my best to trigger a global financial crisis. Um, and after stints uh, in grad school uh, in, in California and then at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, I was really lucky to find myself at TNC, the Nature Conservancy. And I joined the organization really because um, I felt we needed more stories uh, and, and really demonstrations of scalable models for what sustainability and resilience could really look like. And I felt that TNC was a unique vehicle um, to, to do that through because it owned stuff and had a bias and reputation uh, for, for rolling up its sleeves alongside farmers, ranchers, and, and fishers. And initially I joined the organization to work on impact investing um, and quickly found my, myself working on a, a tuna transaction that ultimately failed. Now, no conservation efforts ever fail, of course, but, um, but after this transaction failed, I found myself hooked and have been leading the Conservancy's uh, tuna program for about five years now. Um, so from dreaming of dolphin training to, to uh, a career in, in marine conservation, life has really come for full circle for me. Um, before we dig in, I, I live in Truckee, California with my wife, our, our two kids, and a very, very belligerent Great Pyrenees. So if you're, you find yourself uh, up in this neck of the woods, um, I, would, I would love to meet with you and we can go looking for tuna together. So to set the context, I think a range of factors are, are threatening ocean health today. Um, acidification, warming, pollution. And in that context, um, unsustainable industrial fishing really acts like a threat multiplier that further degrades the, the resilience of marine ecosystems. And it's really hard um, to understand what's happening out on the water. It's away from land. We, we can't see you know, clear-cut forests. We can't see monoculture, agriculture. Um, but there's a really illuminating statistic that, that's always moved me, which is that today, more than half of the ocean surface is covered each year by industrial fishing. Um, and that is more than four times the area uh, covered by all of our land-based agriculture. Just huge, huge uh, footprint in terms of industrial fisheries. Next slide, please. Well, unsustainable fishing is obviously bad for nature. Um, it's also profoundly bad for people. Um, about one in seven people around the planet rely on seafood as a critical source of protein. And particularly in developing countries and in coastal communities, it's oftentimes their, their primary source of protein. Um, it's estimated that we're losing uh, on the order of $50 billion a year due to, to poor and, and unsustainable management. And about two thirds of global fisheries today uh, are now in a place where they're either being fished uh, unsustainably, they're in a degraded condition, uh, or they're declining. So, What's going on out there? Um, when we scan fishery after fishery, um, we see the same basic challenge, which is that we're flying blind. Um, and by that, I mean that we don't have the basic science information that we need to get the rules of the game right. 
and then we don't have the basic compliance information that we need to make sure that fishers are playing by those rules. And, and that's where we get this term that it's the, it's the wild, wild wet. So the region in which I spend much of my time is a really prime example uh, of what's happening in fishery after fishery across the world today. Um, the Western and Central Pacific Ocean is a huge oceanscape covering about a fifth of the planet. Um, and it's dotted with tiny little Pacific Island countries um, that will be familiar to uh, divers and, and to World War, World War II buffs. Uh, in that some of the fiercest battles of, of the war were fought in these nations. Countries like Palau, uh, the Marshall Islands, Kiribati, uh, and the Solomon Islands. And this region is also home to one of the most lucrative fisheries in the world. So each year, uh, almost half of the global tuna catch worth uh, well over $5 billion, sometimes exceeding uh, $15 billion a year, uh, is hauled out of the productive waters of eight Pacific Island countries that have banded together to collectively manage their tuna fisheries and are known as the parties to the Nauru Agreement or the PNA. So you can think of them like the OPEC of tuna. So at the same time that we've got this really uh, massive industrial fishery operating in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean, um, we also know that the Western and Central Pacific is home to uh, a remarkable amount of, of marine biodiversity. It's home to the Coral Triangle, which is really um, considered to be the epicenter of, of uh, global uh, marine biodiversity. Um, and when you overlay intense fishing pressure onto biodiversity hotspots, it's not surprising, I think, um, to, to kind of hear that tuna fisheries environmental impacts uh, are also immense. So to give you a, a sense of, of kind of magnitude here, um, each year about a billion hooks uh, are dropped by longline fishers that are targeting yellowfin tunas, big eye tunas and albacore tunas for everything from the finest sushi restaurants in the world to uh, high-end grocery store shelves. Um, and on those billion hooks, as much as a third of the catch um, can be at-risk non-tuna species, species that include sharks, turtles, rays, marine mammals, uh, and, and seabirds. And the challenge, of course, is that if you take out too many of those, uh, those charismatic species, uh, you really not only put those individual species at risk, but you really put these ecosystems at risk. Um, so those longline fisheries oftentimes are the primary source of mortality uh, for, for at-risk species. So everything from uh, silky sharks uh, to hawksbill and, and green turtles. So um, maybe this is starting to sound a bit grim, um, but if you bear with me, we'll, we'll continue to work through the problem uh, here, and then we'll dig into some of the solutions. Um, the problems as we, as we look more granularly in, in the Pacific um, are threefold, right? We, we um, don't have science and compliance uh, monitoring data. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, and then we've got really weak management regimes in terms of getting the rules right uh, and then being able to enforce them. Why don't we go to the next slide and we'll, we'll dig into each one of those. So what do I mean when I say we don't have the, the data we need to get the rules of the game right? Well, in those longline fisheries that I referenced, um, where we're dropping a billion hooks a year into the ocean, we have less than 5% independent on the water monitoring, typically done uh, by human observers, right? So 95 plus percent of the effort out there on, the, on these open oceans uh, is essentially unmonitored. And I think in that context, it's really not surprising um, to understand that the vast majority of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing is in the licensed fleet, right? We often paint this global picture of dark boats operating under the cover of, of night. And while it's certainly true that in some regions, that's a big problem, it's estimated that in the Pacific, well over 95% of the illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing activities actually occur in that licensed fleet. Um, even worse, I think, is that for that small portion in, in the longline fisheries of, of effort that is observed, we can't have confidence that we're getting accurate data. Right? So too often, um, we've got fundamental incentives where fishers have an interest or a structural incentive for that data that observers are tasked with, with collecting to not be collected 
uh, accurately, whether it be science data or compliance data. Um, and what we see is, is co-option, corruption, uh, and, and oftentimes uh, even worse. So just a couple of weeks ago, uh, an observer from Kiribati uh, was murdered uh, aboard an industrial fishing vessel. Um, so real problems in terms of our ability to, to collect uh, data and no surprise then that we get really rampant levels of, of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing estimated um, to cost this region uh, as much as a billion and a half dollars a year. So the last piece of this is, is of course, when, when you don't have this data, um, it's, it's basically impossible to get the right management regimes in place. It's gonna become more difficult through time uh, as we face climate disruption uh, and, and need more adaptive management. Um, and not only can we not get those rules of the game in place, but we don't have the tools that we need to make sure that fleets are playing by them. So here's where the, the news turns good. Um, I think the really exciting thing is that a new wave of tools is, is coming online that are really helping us to fill these critical and foundational data gaps. Um, everything from remote harvesting uh, of information from anti-collision devices that almost every vessel in the world has aboard to air and, and seaborne drones, wave gliders, cell drone, um, things like that are, are helping us to build what's called marine domain awareness, helping us to understand who's out on the water, where are they, are they fishing in a marine protected area, are they liaising or coming up next to uh, another vessel to do something like uh, transshipment at sea, which is where you can move uh, you know, tunas or shark fins or drugs or humans or weapons from one vessel to another, often a source of, of IUU fishing. Um, there's a bunch of tools that are helping us to, to really um, shine the bright light of transparency out on the open ocean to understand what's happening out there uh, at, a, at a, what I would call a macro level. To really solve problems in, in fisheries like industrial tuna, we actually have to go a step further. We need super granular information uh, on what's happening aboard vessels. Um, what are vessels catching? What are they doing with it? Um, this is where electronic monitoring comes in. So um, electronic monitoring in some sense is, is very sophisticated. Um, in another sense, it's quite simple. It's essentially putting video cameras, sensors, and, and GPS uh, aboard fishing vessels. Um, so instead of having to rely on uh, a small number of, of human absor observers aboard vessels to, to collect accurate information on retained catch, on bycatch of at-risk species, on whether that bycatch comes in uh, alive or dead, on whether it was, was retained or, or released. Um, we are able to, to, to leverage cameras that are on 24 seven automatically recording information. So, so what is the power of EM? What's the power of having video cameras on fishing vessels? Um, well, I think for too long, we've, we've relied on training boat captains and crew on the rules, regulations and, and best practices. Of, of, of fisheries without having pragmatic tools for really reinforcing those trainings. Um, and e-monitoring or electronic monitoring in that context is a, is a critical piece of this puzzle. I wanna warn folks before we move to the next slide that um, if you have young children that have, have joined you um, or you prefer not to watch uh, graphic video content, um, now would be a, a good time to briefly turn away from your screen. So, what you're seeing on this video, um, and I hope everyone can see it okay. What you're gonna see right now is um, a pelagic stingray come onto the vessel and then the crew used what's its typical discard technique, which is slamming the ray against the side of the vessel. Um, and you can see if you look closely that that in fact rips the ray's jaw out. That, that obviously is not a ray that's gonna survive that interaction. I think the good news that you also see there, though, is that a lot of these at-risk species, these sharks, turtles, marine mammals, um, they come into these vessels alive. And EM provides us a really valuable tool for both understanding and then mitigating uh, the impacts of these fisheries on these species. So for example, one of the things that we're really excited about is that we're combining now turtle tagging data that we are uh, doing in, in Melanesia and the Solomon Islands with our electronic monitoring data um, to identify hotspots for potential interactions with these species 
and then working with our industry and government partners to design things like seasonal spatial closures that ultimately minimize the risk of, of bycatch. So really powerful information um, that we're able to leverage to not just drive compliance with best practices uh, for bycatch handling and compliance with, with rules like non-retention and non-finning of sharks, but opening up these new innovative uh, management strategies. I don't know if others are seeing them. There we go. Um, so based on the initial success of, of a project that our California chapter launched in, in the groundfish fishery, um, four years ago, we launched an electronic monitoring project um, in the Pacific's industrial longline tuna fisheries. And we did this with um, four Pacific Island uh, governments, as well as uh, fishing companies from China, uh, Taiwan or Chinese Taipei, uh, the US um, and, uh, and, and South Korea. Um, and we're now moving from that era of pilots um, where the initial conversation was that this was gonna be impossible um, to that era of scale where we've seen our first policy commitments from our government partners um, and the conversation has shifted from impossible to inevitable, from unattainable to sustainable. Um, and that's also pushing us to challenge ourselves. And we're setting our sights higher, um, which is that not only do we wanna support our industry and government partners in reaching 100% on the water transparency in tuna fisheries, um, we are now targeting all global industrial tuna, sorry, all global industrial fisheries for 100% independent on the water monitoring with electronic monitoring by 2028. It's a hugely uh, ambitious goal. Um, it's also a very big bet for the organization. Um, and we think we can get there. So we've developed a four part roadmap um, that we think position, uh, positions us well to drive dramatic increases uh, in global electronic monitoring utilization, moving from a few thousand vessels globally today to tens and hundreds of thousands uh, of vessels over the coming years. So on the water, um, that, that work is really important to us. It's work that I think the, the Nature Conservancy is uniquely positioned to, to execute. And what we've done is we've selected uh, a set of globally representative prototype fisheries. Um, and we're going deep in those fisheries, working alongside industry and governments um, to to get EM to scale and to use getting EM to scale to demonstrate uh, the value of, of collecting this data, right? So we're not just targeting collecting information, we're targeting turning that information into action. Um, and we've got to create value for all the stakeholders involved. That action has got to be not just around management, but around creating private sector value. So for example, some of the fishers with whom we're working that are good actors, that are playing by the rules, are now leveraging electronic monitoring to demonstrate to their supply chain partners that they're leading the way in delivering uh, true bait to plate sustainability, giving their partners confidence that their seafood products were, were harvested legally, sustainably, and without labor abuses. Um, so from high value, low governance fisheries uh, in, in, in terms of Pacific tuna, to high volume mid governance fisheries in Peru and Chile, the Humboldt Current, which is home to the largest fishery in the world by volume, the Anchoveta fishery, to a series of high governance mixed species fisheries between the US, Europe, and New Zealand, we think if we can execute successfully in those geographies that we're not gonna have to repeat our engagement in fishery after fishery after fishery. Um, look, one thing I would say here is, is that the commodity here is not the conservancy being able to bring financial and technical, financial support and technical expertise to the table. The commodity in these geographies is, is trust. Um, trust in the fishing community and trust among our government partners. Um, and I wanna pause to, to talk a little bit um, about our tuna work and, and how that trust is made possible. Um, so the, maybe to give you all a sense of um, how TNC's unique positioning uh, really enables us to do this work. So my partner in this tuna work, uh, Noah Edong, is a Palauan national. Um, he's a Goldman Prize winner. That's an award given out by the Goldman family every year in San Francisco, like the Nobel Prize for, for environmental leadership. Uh, he's a Time Magazine hero for the planet. Um, and he was for a long time, the speaker of, of Palau's uh, Congress. 
And the trust that I have with him, um, based on decades of TNC's commitment uh, in the Pacific, really positions us to bring new ideas and technical expertise to the table uh, with our partners, because our partners ultimately have confidence that we're going to be there at their sides through thick and thin uh, to get things right. And I, I want to be clear, it has not always been a smooth, you know, smooth ride from pilot to, to policy commitment. Um, there are real challenges in moving this stuff in, in capacity constrained geographies. Uh, and that's where the sustained commitment that, frankly, your support uh, enables um, really positions us for success. So the second pillar uh, of this, the first pillar is getting this right, getting this to scale uh, in critical fisheries and geographies around the world. The second pillar uh, in our EM blueprint uh, is really around technology investment. Um, today, we are primarily reliant on pulling, manually pulling hard drives off of fishing vessels and then bringing them to physical data review centers and having human observers review that video. Um, and it creates huge challenges. One is around logistics. Um, vessels in these fisheries may be at sea for as much as six months, um, but it also creates a huge lag between when we have a fishing event and then, we have, and then when we have useful information on it, right? If we've got nine months or 12 months between when a fishing event happens and then when we have analyzed data on it, it really degrades the value of that information. Um, but there's also a second practical challenge here, which is that uh, EM data review accounts for anywhere from 40 to 60% of our annualized costs of running electronic monitoring programs. So if we can't get the cost of data review down, we're going to face challenges in, in driving uh, organic electronic monitoring market penetration. So what we're doing here, what you see on this slide is we're investing heavily in machine learning and artificial intelligence using really the same tools and frameworks that Facebook, for example, uses to differentiate uh, the faces of the people on this call um, to differentiate between tunas and turtles and ultimately the flag when, when sharks are getting finned. Um, and our goal uh, for this year is to test same day analyzed data using a combination of pushing uh, automated data analytics out onto vessels beaming some of that, um, that pre-processed information uh, up into the cloud uh, via satellite, and then putting a more intensive set of machine learning algorithms and human eyes uh, onto that information. So really compressing the time frame from phishing event to useful information, and in so doing, increasing the value of this data and bringing down the cost uh, of data analysis. We think it's really important for this data to be able to keep pace with the pace of global seafood supply chains. So the third leg of our blueprint is around policy. Um, last year, uh, we were really um, honored to, to kind of share this stage with our partners in the Federated States of Micronesia. This is the 14th largest exclusive economic zone in the world, home to a heap of biodiversity. Um, and this small island developing state took the bold step of becoming the first developing country in the world to commit to 100% on the water transparency in its waters. Um, it also issued a call to action to its industry partners and to its Pacific Island peers. Um, and that commitment and call to action are being met. This isn't just a paper commitment. We're now working really intensively with the Federated States of Micronesia to implement its EM, its, or its electronic monitoring program with a goal of 100% coverage by 2023. And now we've seen the first private sector firms. In fact, the first private sector firm was a Chinese uh, vertically integrated tuna fishing company uh, join this call to action and commit to 100% monitoring. So the last pillar um, of our strategy is really around markets. Um, we're only going to get so far um, if, if we can't drive markets to care uh, about their seafood being harvested legally, sustainably, and without labor abuses. There is no doubt that electronic monitoring costs money. Um, but I think what's exciting um, is that we're seeing some early momentum um, in, in key markets around the world. Um, there are two critical pieces of our work here. One is that we're aiming to integrate electronic monitoring requirements um, into the, the globally leading sustainability standard. That's the Marine Stewardship Council. So when you go to the grocery store, you often see a blue check mark uh, on, on sustainably harvested seafood products. That's the Marine Stewardship Council. Um, and we're working closely to, to integrate electronic monitoring or higher 
levels of, of monitoring requirements into the standard. And then the second piece of this is that we're really optimistic that we're going to bring our first major U.S. retailer commitment to 100% on the water transparency in their seafood supply chains uh, to the table this calendar year. Look, this is not inevitable. Um, and electronic monitoring is, is not a panacea. Um, but I am convinced that we cannot do it without electronic monitoring. We cannot get to sustainable, resilient fisheries and oceans without much better data. And the same technological, technological revolution that I talked about optimistically uh, earlier in this, in this presentation, um, you can bet that fishers are leveraging some of those same technologies to drive more efficient operations, more efficient harvesting. And so if we continue to let that move unrestrained, we're gonna be in even bigger trouble with bigger tragedy for humans and, and nature. Um, look, we can solve um, this data problem, but we've got to solve it now. We don't have 20 years to get this right. We're at this critical moment where oceans can recover, fisheries can recover, um, but, but we've got to stop the bleeding now. So maybe just to close here, some, some big picture takeaways. Um, the, the first is that when we, when we scan global fisheries, um, they're in trouble. And when we look across these fisheries, we see that in fishery after fishery, um, much of the problem owes to the reality that we're flying blind. We, we have critical data gaps. And I hope that I've made the case to you all that we've got to drive towards 100% transparency in global industrial fisheries to fill these critical data gaps. The second piece of this then is that a range of tools are really helping us to shine that bright light of transparency onto our oceans. Um, and in the context of, of electronic monitoring is really building data that we have a bunch of fisheries to get the rules of the game right, understanding what vessels are doing, what fishers are doing on board vessels. So I want to close with this. Um, I, I see um, friends on, on this webcast, and I want to thank you all um, for your support for the program, but I also want to thank this group for your broader support of, of the Nature Conservancy. Um, I'm more convinced today than, than when we started into this um, that we can do this. I think we've got real momentum. I think we've got a plan um, to make the strategic on the water technology policy in markets and, and, and markets investments that can get us to scale. We need a bunch of chips to fall our way, um, but I think we've got a real shot and leveraging electronic monitoring to drive resilient fisheries and, and resi resilient ocean ecosystems. Well, thank you for inspiring us. I, I'm amazed at what we are doing and uh, we really appreciate your leadership in this space. It's been great to see you and thank you, Mark, for your leadership and for your time today. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Happy Earth Day. Okay, bye-bye.